tonight, I want you to take your Bibles tonight, and I'm going to get you to look at several different passages of Scripture to start the message off this evening. I'm going to preach to you on what I believe would be one of the most important subjects in the life of the child of God tonight. I told you I was going to preach it Sunday night, and Brother Workman and the men showed up and uh, really wanted to hear what he had to say, and the Lord helped us through that preaching. And uh, if you, it, let me just pause right there and say this. If you weren't here Sunday night or, or you missed um, Sunday night service or whatever, please do yourself a favor. You'll thank me later. Go back. And watch Sunday night service, Brother Brian Workman preached for us on YouTube or on Facebook. I promise you it'll be a help and a blessing to you. He preached on it's not foolish to be faithful. Man, one of the greatest messages on faithfulness that I think I've ever heard out of the life of Uriah. It helped me. And uh, man, I'm telling you what, I believe it'll help you too. So go back and listen to that. But anyways, so this is what I was going to give you on Sunday night and the Lord led a different direction. But I believe to be one of the most important yet many times the most overlooked aspect and area of the life of the child of God. We'll begin in Isaiah chapter 34. We're just going to look at the first part of Isaiah 34 and verse 16. When you find Isaiah 34, 16, I need you to turn to John chapter 5 and verse number 39. Then we'll look at one more verse of Scripture. But you'll want to keep your Bible open tonight um, because we're going to use a lot of Scripture to back up the things which we say throughout the course of the message. Many of these verses, if, if not most all of them, I could quote them to you. But I don't think many times that helps us for me just to quote Bible to you. I really want you to see it with your eyeballs. I really want your hands to, to handle where these passages are, find them, mark them, be acquainted with them, uh, because it's not just good enough for the pastor to know Bible. Uh, you need to know the Bible. Listen to me tonight. Just the pastor knowing the Bible ain't doing you a lot of good when a spiritual attack comes on you. You need to know what the Word of God says tonight. My job as the pastor is to feed you the Word of God. But your job is to take it, digest it, and put it into practical use in your daily life and search these scriptures for yourself. So anyways, Isaiah chapter 34 and verse number 16. Isaiah 34 verse 16. Watch what the Lord says to His people in verse 16. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and what? Read. Let's, let's read that again. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. Now this is a command tonight to God's people. It's kind of hard to do this command if you don't have the book of the Lord. I'm glad I've got the book of the Lord tonight. I can seek out of it and read tonight this verse of Scripture that what I just read to you, my home church where I uh, was a member of for years and God uh, saved me calling to preach and all, it was on the front of the pulpit. My pastor had it plastered on the front of the pulpit. Seek you out of the book of the Lord and read. Now let's go all the way to John chapter number 5. John chapter 5 and verse number 39. And watch what the Lord Jesus says in John chapter 5. And verse number 39, John 5 and 39 tonight. We just read where the Lord in the Old Testament said, Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. Now John 5, 39, God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, says this in John 5, 39, Search the Scriptures. I don't know how I'm supposed to do that if I don't have them tonight. Do you realize every major Christian, every major Christian college, seminary, and university does not believe tonight that you have the Scriptures in your hands. They only believe the Scriptures were in original manuscripts that have been lost for millennia tonight and nobody's got them. I don't believe that. I've got the Scriptures in my hand tonight. Yes, I do. Jesus said, search the scriptures. Why, Lord? For in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they, the scriptures, are they which testify of me. Would you look at one more verse of scripture with me? We know this verse, but it's good to see it again. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 15 tonight. 
And we'll look at this last piece of Scripture and dive off in the message. But like I say, keep your Bible open. As we get into the points of the message, we'll use Scripture to back up what we're saying tonight. 2 Timothy 2 and 15. We saw where the Lord said in Isaiah to seek. Then we find where the Lord Jesus said to search. And now we're going to find where that great apostle Paul under inspiration of the Holy Ghost says this in verse 15 of 2 Timothy in chapter 2. Study to show thyself approved unto God. We are not to study to try and look good among each other. We study, search, and seek out of the Scriptures so we might be approved to the Lord. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Tonight I've just read to you three different portions of Scripture where the Bible declares, where the Holy Ghost demands that each and every child of God seek, search, and study out of the Scriptures tonight. Now I'm going to preach to your heart tonight on this thought. I'm preaching on the benefits of of the Bible. The benefits of the Bible. If you wanted a secondary title tonight, this would be your secondary title tonight. And and I'm really really excited to preach this early in the year because I want you to grab this early in the year. If you want a secondary title, it's this. The importance of reading your Bible. The importance of reading your Bible. And you say, preacher, we ain't little kids in Sunday school. We ain't the 8, 9, and 10 year old class. Well then start reading your Bible. If you would not, if you'd read your Bible, I wouldn't have to preach on reading your Bible. But the fact is, we all tonight get to some places in our life where we just kind of put the book to the side. We don't read it like we should. We don't heed it like we should. We don't seek out of it like we should. We don't search it like we should. We don't study it like we should. And tonight, I want to try and give you an exhortation and encouragement and maybe a rebuke where we need it tonight to read and study and search our Bibles this evening. Can I say I believe the greatest benefit and the greatest blessing of my life is not my wife, even though I love her and she is a crown to her husband. And man, she there's not a person in this world outside of Jesus Christ I value any more highly than my wife tonight. The greatest benefit God ever gave me was not my four beautiful children, even though I have three wonderful daughters and one ugly little boy. But I thank God for them tonight. Though those ain't the best. I love all of y'all tonight. I die for each and every one of you. I love the church. I love the sheep. God lets me up, Pastor. I thank God for you. But you ain't the best benefit God's ever gave me. May I say it's not my house. It's not my money. It's not my car. It's not my clothes. The greatest thing that God ever dropped in the lap of Cody Zorn's life was this blessed old book that I hold in my hand tonight. It has been my constant companion. It has been my guide through life. It it is what guides me in all matters of faith and practice. I don't know how to be a husband without the Bible tonight. I don't know how to be a daddy without the Bible tonight. I don't know how to get to heaven without the Bible tonight. I don't have nothing to preach to you without the Bible tonight. You say, preacher, you really put that thing on a pedestal, don't you? I sure do tonight. It is the words of the living God given to me in my language preserved and inspired without error, without blemish, without spot without fail and tonight the most important thing you got in your life is the word of God given to you friend I wonder why we think so little of it tonight. Huh? The Bible, somebody said one time years ago, sin will keep you from this book or this book will keep you from your sin. I believe that's right. You won't spend any better time in life than the time you spend in your Bible tonight. I wonder why we think so little of it. I found this out. The devil doesn't think little of the Bible. The devil doesn't think little of it. He knows where the power of the child of God's life is at. He knows where the strength of the child of God comes from. That's why he tries to keep you away from it. That's why he tries to get you to scroll Facebook instead of scroll God's book. That's why he tries to get you to look at the TV instead of looking in the mirror of the Word of God. Hey, 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 the devil doesn't think little of it. The first attack the devil ever made when he showed up was he attacked what God said. He told Eve, he said, Yea, hath God said... 
He attacked that Bible. Hey, the devil thinks a lot of it. As a matter of fact, when the devil showed up to tempt the Lord, he used Bible to try and tempt the Lord. The devil knows about that book tonight. Do you realize there's only one book? Just one. Just one. There's only one book that is banned in over 50 countries worldwide tonight. You know what that book is? It, it's not It's not Mayo Say Tongues, little red communist book. It's not some sort of manifesto by Stalin. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not the Muslims book, uh, uh, Brother Tonight of the Koran. It's not some book by Buddha. Name of one book tonight that's banned in over 50 plus countries. You know what that book is? It's that book you're holding in your lap. If you're holding the King James Bible, how come they so scared of it? It's just a little old book. It's just 66 books written by farmers and peasants and nobodies and put in this book. I mean, it, it surely can't be that big a deal, but this book liberates people. This book sets people free. This book changes people. This book saves people. They sum about this book tonight. Do you realize they don't try and correct the New International Version? They don't try and come up with a, a, a new, new King James Version. They don't try and correct the Message Bible. Do you realize there's only one Bible they're trying to pervert? There's only one Bible they're trying to corrupt? There's only one Bible they're trying to mess up? And that's a King James 1611 authorized version tonight. Hey, the devil thinks a lot of that Bible. I tell you who else thinks a lot of that Bible? The Lord thinks a lot of that Bible. You say, how much does God value that book? Well, Psalm chapter 138 and verse number 2 said, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Whoa. Hey, I read where the Bible said God gave Jesus a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that he's Lord of the glory of God the Father. And the Bible said God put his word even above his name tonight. You say, why is that? Because a man's name ain't good if his word ain't good tonight. Y'all listen to me. If I can't trust every word in that King James Bible tonight, then I can't trust the God that gave it to me this evening. Hey, if his word ain't no good, then his name ain't no good tonight. If he's a liar, if he can't preserve his word and give it to me tonight in perfection, I can't trust him this evening. But I can trust him. That Bible said every word of God is pure. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. The words of the Lord, Psalm 12, are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou wilt keep them, O Lord. Thou wilt preserve them from this generation and forever. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Uh, You hear me friend? Uh, God thinks a lot of his book tonight whether anybody else does or not. You know what the longest chapter in your Bible is? Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is almost, almost directly in the middle of your Bible. The direct middle of your Bible is Psalm 103. And just to the right of that 17 chapters is the longest chapter of the Bible, Psalm 119. It's 176 verses. Do you realize out of those 176 verses, all but five directly mention the words of God in some shape, form, or fashion? 171 verses out of 176 mentions the Word of God. The longest chapter in the Bible, almost directly in the middle of the Bible, has nothing to say but about the Word of God tonight. I'd say God thinks a lot of it, friend. So if the devil thinks a whole lot of it and the Lord thinks a lot of it, I'm just curious why we don't think much of it. Oh, we carry Bibles. We carry Bibles, but we don't read Bibles. We have Bibles, but we don't heed Bibles. I mean, tonight, look here. I mean, I would never embarrass you. Truly, I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't go around this room and do it. I ain't gonna. But I'm just asking you a question I want you to answer in the stillness of your heart. When is the last time you picked that book up and read it not in a church service setting? If it's been that long, shame on you, child of God. I say you're an anemic, malnourished Christian tonight, child of God. You need that book tonight, friend. I'm not up here just spouting off at the mouth. I'm talking about the Bible. 
There's a crazy, there's a crazy cockeyed bunch of mess going on even among pseudo, you know, pseudo independent Baptists and all these goofuses. And they say things like this. I heard somebody say this here recently and it caught a lot of traction. And they said this, Brother Mike. They said, we are to preach the word. We're not to preach about the word. Well, that's impossible because the word says a lot about the word. If I'm going to preach the Word, then I'm going to have to also preach about the Word because a lot of the Word talks about the Word. Preach, preach the Word, don't preach about the Word. Well, that's stupid. If I'm going to preach the Word, when the Word says something about the Word, I'm preaching about the Word. So tonight I'm preaching to you about the Word. I'm going to preach the Word about the Word tonight. Daily Bible reading. I believe it's important to read it daily. I just read over in Deuteronomy chapter 17. And as a matter of fact, look at it. We're going to look at a bunch of verses tonight. We might as well just go ahead and start looking at them. Look at Deuteronomy 17. I just come across this in my Bible reading the other day. I've never seen this before. Deuteronomy 17. That's what I love about systematic Bible reading. You say you believe you ought to read it every day? I believe you ought to read it every day. I believe you ought to read it every day. I try and make it a personal practice to read it every day of my life. I believe it'll help you. I believe it'll do something with you. Look at Deuteronomy 17 and watch what the Bible said in verse 18. Old old Moses here is writing and talking about in the future when the people of God do get a king. They ain't got a king yet, but they're gonna. And God is already trying trying to tell them some things that'll help them. Deuteronomy 17, 18. And it shall be when he the king that that will come, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law. He didn't even have the original himself. It's a copy, but it's the word of God. He'll write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priest, the Levites. Now watch verse 19. This will help me. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life. Why? Why? That he may learn to fear the Lord his God to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. Now I want to say this to you. If it was important for a king like David to read the book every day of his life, I promise you it's important for me and you to read the book every day of our life. As a matter of fact, I'll go so far to say this. I believe this with all my heart. You want to know why David got up off the bed and went out there and started looking and lusting after Bathsheba and fell into immorality with her? I know why he did. He wasn't reading his book no more. Old David stopped reading his book like he should, and when he stopped reading his book, what I told you a minute ago, sin will keep you from that book, or that book will keep you from your sin. Old David quit reading it like he should. So tonight I'm going to show you several things that's a benefit of your Bible. What is the benefits of our Bible? It benefits all kinds of things. Man, I love this stuff. It benefits all kinds of things. Can I say, firstly, it benefits your feet. (laughs) It'll benefit your feet. You say, what do you mean it'll benefit my feet? Well, look at Psalm chapter 119. That great psalm I was talking about a minute ago, right near about in the middle of your Bible. Look at Psalm 119 and verse 105. Psalm 119, 105. You know this verse, but it's good to look at it. Psalm 119 and 105. It, number one, benefits your feet. You say, what do you mean it benefits my feet? Well, look at what your book said. Psalm 119 and verse 105 tonight. Here's the first thing that is a benefit of the Bible. Psalm 119, 105. It says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know what that book is? It's navigation. It gives light in the dark. You you know what he's saying here? He's saying, God, there's been many times in my life I had no direction of which way to go because it's dark out here in this world. You do realize the Bible says it's a dark world we're living in. The prince and the power of the darkness is over this thing right now. It's a dark world we're living in. Have you looked around how dark it's getting out there, brother? I mean, it's a dark time. It's a dark day. There's dark people out there. You say, how am I supposed to navigate if I can't see? You've got to have a light for your feet. You've got to have a light to know you ain't stepping off in a hole. 
You got to have a light to make sure you're staying on the right path. You got to have a light for your feet. You say, you say, preacher, I don't think a light's that big a deal. Let's show them how big a deal it is, brother Mike. Help me out back there. A light's a big deal. A light's a real big deal. Cut them off. Cut them off. Praise God. Look at the, look at how big a deal a good light is tonight. Here we are out here in this lost, wicked, ungodly world, brother. I can't see where I'm going. I'm in a mess. I'm a stumble. You touch my daughter in the dark, I'm gonna break your neck, son. Uh, <laughs> I'm stumbling around out here and bumming around out here. I don't know which way I'm going. I can't see y'all. Y'all can't see me. Y'all, let's just be honest. There's been some times in my life, Brother Keith, this is the way I felt in my life. I didn't know which way I was going. I couldn't see which way to go. And about that time, I'd sit down and I'd crack open the pages of that blessed old Bible. And when I cracked open the page, all right, Lord, I got you, God. Well, you, you see something about that light? It said it's a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. Can I say what the Word of God is not? It's not this. It don't let you see necessarily way out there all the time. But I'll tell you what it does do. It lets you see what's right in front of you. Okay, God, I'll step in that light. And God, if you'll give me more light, I'll just walk in the light day by day. I need light every day. I may not know what's coming way off out yonder, but I can see what's coming day by day because I got a book that's guiding my feet tonight. Click us back on up there, Brother Mike, if you would. I got a book that helps guide my feet this evening. You say, what's the benefit of this Bible? It's navigation for my feet, friend. You say, I don't know what I ought to do. Get in the book. It'll tell you what to do. Preacher, I don't know how to be the right kind of father to my children. Get in the book. It'll tell you how to be the right kind of father to your children. You say, Preacher, I don't know how to be the right kind of wife to my husband. And I want to be the right kind of wife. I promise you, if you'll get in that book, it'll tell you how to be the right kind of wife. You say, Preacher, I want to treat my wife correctly. And I want to be a good husband. How do I do it? Get in the book. Say, Preacher, I want a victorious Christian life. How do I live it? Get in the book. Get in the book. Get in the book. It'll give light to your feet tonight. Not only is it a benefit to your feet, but it's a benefit for food. It's not only a benefit for feet, it's a benefit for food. This book is the nourishment for the child of God's life. You realize if you read the Bible, you'll find that there are about five or six different things that the Bible is likened unto for nourishment, for consumption. The, the first thing I'd like to show you uh, that will help keep you spiritually healthy, if you don't read it, it'll keep you malnourished. No wonder there's so many sickly Christians. Sick Christians. I'm not talking about sick like physically sick. We all get physically sick. I'm talking about spiritually sick tonight. Anemic, spiritually sick Christians. Why? Because they ain't that book. That book will keep you healthy spiritually. I ain't saying you ain't going to get the sniffles or the COVID or cancer. That's what I'm talking about. I'm saying, I'm, brother, I have walked into some hospital rooms and look, brother, look, brother, dead in the eye of some people that was dying physically. I mean, they were sick. They didn't feel good. But son, I walked in. They had the glow of God in their heart. There was something inside that kept them healthy spiritually. You say, what was it? It was that book. It was that book. The first thing I find about that book is it's bread. It's bread. Look what your Bible said. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy 8 and verse number 4. Deuteronomy 8, 4. It's bread. Watch this. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse number 4. He said it's bread. Jesus quotes this very same verse when he's dealing with the devil uh, in Luke chapter 4 and in Matthew chapter 4, Jesus quotes this very same verse when the devil tried to tell him to command the stones to be made bread. This is where Jesus goes back to when he says it is written. Deuteronomy 8, I'm sorry, 3, 8, 3, not 4. Deuteronomy 8, 3, the Bible said, And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only. Look, the comparison he's about to make, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. I'll quote this one to you because we're going to look at it later, but Ephesians 5.26, Ephesians 5.26 said, the washing of water 
by the Word. The Word is also likened unto water. So you know what God gives us to keep us healthy? He gives us bread and water. Now I know what you're thinking. You're sitting there thinking, Preacher, I don't like just bread and water. That's just about like prison rations. I know that. But you can at least survive on bread and water. But we have a God tonight that He don't just feed us prison rations. He don't just keep us on bread and water. He gives us more than that. He gives us more, exceeding abundantly above all we can ask. What else does He give us? Go to Hebrews chapter 5. It's also meat tonight. God gives us meat. I'll tell you what. I don't believe you eat a meal until you have meat with it. Say amen right there. All you bunch of vegan people, praise God, which I'm looking around. I don't see no vegan people, I don't guess. But anybody might be vegan watching this. I don't know how you survive, man. If you don't have meat with your food, I don't even consider it a meal. I've gone out a couple times and Brother Skip just tried to eat a salad for my food. That just didn't cut it. Now you can fry some chicken and throw it on there and I'll eat the salad along got some fried chicken or some grilled steak on there. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. But you got to doctor that. You got to doctor that rabbit food up before I'm going to consider it a meal tonight. Uh, a, a salad ain't nothing but the appetizer before the meat gets here. You know what I'm saying? Look what he said about meat. Look at what this book is. Hebrews 5 and verse number 12. Hebrews 5, 12. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even though who's by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You know what I got here sitting here tonight on, on this platform? I got T-bone steak, brother. I, I, I've heard people say things like this before. They, they say things, Brother Fred, like, well, I, 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 I read them other versions every once in a while. You know, I'll read some of them other versions, and, and I'll get a little get out of them. And I think to myself why in God's name would you call through a septic tank to get a nugget when you got T-bone steak sitting on the table at the house. I ain't got to crawl through a blessed God septic tank that the devil has flushed the sewer into to try and get a little nugget. I got steak. I got ribeye at the house. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Look here. You say, oh, we need, some, we, need, we need something deeper. That's plenty deep enough, brother. That's plenty all you need right there. I promise you that. That'll drown you right there. It's not just meat, and it's not just water, and it's not just bread, but I just read to you here, and you can also write down 1 Peter 2, 2. It's also milk. 1 Peter 2, 2 said, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. That milk is the nectar of God. It helps us grow. It puts growth in us. It supplies that which our body needs. It's water. It's bread. It's meat. It's milk. And then it gets better than that. You got a sweet tooth tonight? God said it'll even give you something for the sweet tooth. Look at Psalm 19. I'm talking about benefits of the Bible. I'm telling you what God said about His Word. I'm hoping by the time this is over with that we all come to the same conclusion that this book is really important in our life. And if you're not planning on reading it this year, I hope you'll pick it up and start reading it. Y'all realize this? I, 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 look, I ain't trying to shame you. I, I, I ain't. I'm just preaching to you here for just a minute. Listen to me. You say, well, I don't read good. I don't this, that. Y'all realize about four or five chapters a day is all it'll take to get you through that thing once a year. I mean, I'm talking about like maybe 30 minutes at the most. If you're a really slow reader, and I'm not criticizing you. If you are, I don't read super fast. If you're a real slow reader, 30 minutes a day will get you through that book once a year. You say, is it important? Yes, it's important. You say, but that Old Testament ain't written to us. I've told you before, Paul said, what's everything's written aforetime, written for our learning. We through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. It's all important tonight, brother. Anyways, look what he said. It's, it's something good and sweet, too. I told you it's for food. Look at verse 10. He said, well, look at verse 9. This whole chapter near about is about the Word of God. It's a great chapter. Verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also 
than honey. And you want something sweet? It's even got sweet stuff in there. And the honeycomb. Do y'all see about that book? It gives you the full diet tonight. It's got the full diet. Milk, water, bread, meat, uh, honey. It's got the full spectrum of diet tonight to keep you healthy. As a matter of fact, we could probably throw one more in there and I don't believe I'd be stretching it. The Bible said in the book of Proverbs, a word fitly spoken, and that book's a word fitly spoken, a word fitly spoken are like apples of gold in pictures of silver. You know what else? That, thing? that thing's like apples tonight. It didn't give you a little bit of fruit to go along with it. God ain't got good, man. Look here, who doesn't like some hot bread with some honey on it? <laughs> Glory to God, friend. I ain't just talking about this old stale, moldy bread. No, sir. This is hot bread baked off of heaven's bakery. And when it comes to us, it's like that manna. Do y'all remember what that manna was? It said it was like bread with honey on it. Bread with honey on it. It's a picture of the Word of God that God sends the bread with the honey on it it and gives us some sweet tea tonight. I realize it ain't all it ain't all honey and bread. Sometimes look here, I just bro, I just come through Leviticus myself with fear and trembling. I just come through some of them begats and begats and this and that myself. And look here, it's some of that stuff ain't nothing sweet about it. I, I still ain't never figured out why God put number seven in the Bible. I don't know. I figured out in that one day in the glory world, maybe God will answer me. But of all them years I've read that Bible and 20 plus times going through it, I still don't understand why God put numbers chapter seven in the Bible. Somebody else figured that one out for me. You say, what's number seven? It's when all them princes in Israel come to give an offering to the Lord. And when they come, they all give the exact same thing. There's 12 of them. Each tribe brings some. 12 of them. And they all bring the exact same thing. One lamb, one ram, one he goat of the lamb for a burnt offering, one tablespoon of this and one teaspoon of that. And, one. and it gives a litany list of what they brought. And instead of just saying, all these guys brought this. I mean, what it does, it says, this guy brought and it lists the whole thing. And then it goes to the next guy. And this guy brought and it lists the whole thing. And it does it 12 cotton picking times. You say, what do you do? Do you skip over it? No, nope. I read all 12 of them and I just plunge on through it. You say, what good's it doing you? I don't know, but I believe it's doing something for me. You say, well, that's a stupid view. No, no, it's not stupid at all. I tell you this, I tell you this, if I was to stand up any man in here tonight and say, hey, do me a favor. Tell me what your wife cooked for you for dinner three weeks ago. I mean, three weeks ago today, Brother Skip, tell me what Sister, uh, Sister Sheila cooked for you on Thursday evening three weeks ago. You ain't got a clue. But y'all look at that fine specimen of a man right there. <laughs> the proof is in the pudding. That meal helped him. The proof is in the pudding. Even though he can't remember what he put in his jowls, it got to the belly. It kept him healthy. And I may not be able to remember everything I read every day of the week of that book, but just by reading it, it is nourishing me. It's putting something in me to help me stay alive spiritually tonight. You may not remember all of it, but it's helping you. Read it, read it, read it, read it. It's helping you tonight. Amen. Don't just wait till it's your Sunday school lesson or wait till the preacher asks you to look at something particular. Just pick it up and read the thing, man. Just read it. Anyways, we find it's food. It's, it's all the food you need. It's food. It's for your feet. I'll tell you what else it's for, benefit of it. It's for a fight. It's for a fight. It'll help you in the fight. Look, look at your Bible. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. We know these verses. I told you we was going to look at some that you know, but they're good to look at. It's good reminders. Ephesians chapter 6. And look what it said in verse number 17. Look at down here. The last thing... The very last piece of equipment that Paul tells us to take into the battle against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Look at the very last thing that the Lord tells us to take. It's good for the fight. Verse 17, Ephesians 6. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword 
of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The backup verse to this is Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's the cross-reference for this verse right here that you're to write down the margin of your Bible. Now listen to me. The Bible said in Psalm chapter 150, let the high praises of God be in their lips and a sharp two-edged sword in their hand. I say that's good advice tonight. You know the only thing we got to fight the devil with? I can't fight him with Cody Zorn's words. I ain't smart enough. I ain't got enough to shoot back at the devil with. He'll twist me all up and foul me all up, chew me up and spit me out. But brother, I got something that can fight him. You know what the Bible said? I believe it's, let me see if I can grab this out real fast. The Bible talks about the devil. He, he is Leviathan. And in Job 41, it tells us all about this Leviathan. And over there somewhere, it says something about the sword of God. There it is. There it is. Uh, no, no, Psalm, let's see. Chapter 40, verse... Uh, yeah, okay, before that, before that, he's talking about behemoth, also a type of the devil as well. And it says this in Job 40 and verse 19, it said he is the chief of the ways of God, talking about behemoth, but it said he that made him, talking about God made him, he that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. In other words, it said, oh, behemoth is a bad dude, but the one that made him has a sword that can pierce him. Y'all, the devil's a bad dude, but God made a sword. God made a weapon that can pierce through the devil tonight. But you got to have the book, got to have the book. It's a two-edged sword. It's a two-edged sword. On one side, it can be a blessing. On the other side, it can be a, bless, a blistering. <laughs> Y'all ever felt that out of the Word of God before? I have. I'm telling you, there's been times in my life where the Word of God has been such a blessing to me. And then there's been some times I read it and it tanned my fanny. I said, Lord, help. I think tanning my hide, Lord. It, it's a two-edged sword. On one side, it delivers. On the other side, it damns. The same Word of God that delivers people from hell is the same Word of God that damns people to hell if they reject it tonight. It's two-edged. It works two ways. It's for your fight. It's for your feet. It's for your food. I got so much more I can say on that, but I ain't got time. This really is a message for, for two nights. But anyways, I'm going to give you these last two things and we're going to go. It's also for forming and framing. What's the benefit of this book? It forms you. It frames you. Look at what your Bible said in Jeremiah 23. I'm giving you all these pictures, all these types. You ought to record all these and keep them down so you know what the book is a picture of all throughout it. Jeremiah 23 and verse number 29. Jeremiah 23, 29. I'm not going to give you all the pictures and types. There's even some more in there, but these are the biggest ones this evening. Jeremiah 23, 29. Well, we'll start in verse 28. This, this is a great verse too, dealing with the Word of God. Verse 28, Jeremiah 23, 28. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And this is what I'm doing tonight. This is what I'm fixing to read to you. This is what I'm doing tonight. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. I'm telling to you what God said. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Watch it, verse 29, is for forming and framing. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Just like that sword is a two-edged sword. It can destroy or it can help. It can be a blessing. The hammer of the Word of God, it can be used as a force of destruction. It can tear something down or it can frame. That's what a hammer does. It frames. It builds things up tonight. Paul said this in Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. He said, Now I commend you to God and the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up. You know what I'm doing tonight? I'm taking this hammer and I'm trying to work on your life. That's what I'm doing. You know what I'm doing? I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm pounding on you. I'm trying to beat something in your head, Abigail. Listen! That's my young and I can do that. I ain't going to do it to you nor to you. I'm going to do it to you. Take a hammer and beat on you. You know what it does? It's knocking things out that ought not to be in there, but it's building stuff up that ought to be in there tonight. That hammer does that tonight. It builds up. It'll build something in your life. You know what that book will do? It'll build character in your life. It'll build holiness in your life. But it won't do no good if you don't do something with it. 
You know what the Bible said in the book of Hebrews in chapter 4? It said, but the word that was preached unto them did not profit, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. If you don't put faith in what's being said, it ain't doing you no good. We can all sit here tonight and say, Woo, glory to God, I believe the King James Bible. And yes, sir, that's the word of God. But if we don't believe it and then put it into practice, what good does it do us tonight? But when you believe that book and put it into practice, it goes to framing your life up. Building something in your life. You want God to build something in your life? Heed and read the book tonight. You say, it can't be that simple. It's that simple tonight. You know what every man in here hates? I'll tell you what every man in here hates. From this man to all you men. We hate building things by the directions. Come on now. Y'all know that's right. I, I have almost, I've almost refused my wife to buy anything for my children that require assembly for Christmas anymore. I hate doing it. You know why I hate doing it? I hate following the directions. I mean, it comes out of the box. I looked at the picture of it. It can't be that hard to put a screw in and screw there and this in and this in and throw it together and bam, there it is. Here we bought that when the nursery got renovated back there here a while back and bought that little table and chairs and all that in there. I thought, well, I need no direction to put, you know, a two-year-old table together. Directions. Me and my brother end up putting it together and Brother Charlie come in there and looked at it and said, who put that together? I was like, my brother did. <laughs> I mean, the back, one of the backs of it was flipped upside down and turned the wrong way and all that. You know, you know why I was like that? We didn't follow the directions. We didn't think we needed to. We figured, oh, we got this. No big deal. It's a two-year-old table. We got this thing, man. Yeah, we should have followed the directions. You know the problem with a lot of Christians? They just look at things and they think, well, that, that's why the Bible said, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. Stop doing it like you want to do it. Why? You're going to mess it up. Amen. It's for forming and framing. I'll tell you what else it's for. It's for filth. It gets the filth out. Ephesians 5, 26. Write that one down. Turn to Psalm 119, 9. Turn to Psalm 119, 9. The Bible said he had cleansed the church with the washing of the water by the word. This is a great verse right here. Every young man in this building, every young man in this building needs to commit to memory Psalm 119 verse 9. Psalm 119 9 is something every young man needs to grab hold of. It's for the filth. It gets the filth out of your life. Psalm 119 9 says this. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way. How you young men in here going to keep your way clean in a world full of filth? How in the world you young men going to keep your eyes clean and your mind clean and your heart clean in a world full of straight up filth? Here it is. By taking heed thereto. According to thy word. And two verses later he said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth tonight. You want to keep clean? He said, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. You want to keep the filth out of your life? Here it is right here. It's not just drinking water. It's washing water. You wash your mind. Cleanse your mind with the book. Scrub your mind. Get your heart clean. Wash your heart. Wash your heart. Your feet get dirty. Wash your feet. Feet get dirty. Your hands get dirty. Wash your hands. Hey, wash your eyes. Oh, your eyes get filthy in this world. Wash them. Your ears get dirty. You hear junk. Wash your ears out. You say, how do I do it? The book washes you tonight. It'll keep you clean. It's also a mirror. That's how you keep the filth out. James said in James chapter 1, it's the perfect law of liberty that we look into. You know what you do with a mirror? You look at the mirror so you can see what kind of nasty you got on you. And you clean yourself up based off what the mirror tells you. I ain't never seen nobody walk up and look at a mirror. I've never seen anybody walk up, look at a mirror, and have, you know, a zit or a pimple or dirt or nastiness here or there, you know, white stuff in the corners of your mouth. Have you woke up from sleeping all night, gunk on your teeth, and you make up smear it all up this way and that way and all down through here like some other Halford Hitchcock movie you get up. I ain't never seen nobody walk up and look in the mirror and say, You a lie. I look good. I ain't going to mess with you. I think I look good. I don't care what you say. I'm on, I'm, now, I've seen some people at Walmart. Obviously, they thought that. <laughs> I've seen some people at Walmart. Obviously, they, they either busted their mirror, threw their mirror away, or thought their mirror lied to them. 
Yeah, because they didn't, they, didn't, they didn't look at what I was looking at, I promise you that. But for a child of God, you want to keep your face looking right in the sight of God? Look at the mirror. It'll tell you what you look like. So it's for filth. It's for forming and framing. It's for food. It's for your feet. It's for a fight. And it'll make you fruitful. Look at Luke 8, 11. Don't look at it right now, but just write it down. Luke chapter 8, verse number 11. And the Bible's talking about the sower and the seed. And you know what it said about the seed? It said, the seed is the word of God. You know what seed does? It brings fruit. It makes things fruitful. You want to bring fruit forth in your Christian life? Get that book and sow it in your heart. It'll bring something up. If a man sows to the flesh, he'll of the flesh reap corruption. But if the man sows to the Spirit, he of the Spirit reaps life everlasting, the Bible said. What are you sowing? Whatever you put down going to come up. Yeah, Luke chapter 8, verse 11. Luke 8, 11. You want something to grow spiritually? Put something spiritual down. You want something carnal in your life? Throw something carnal down. I'm talking about the benefits of the Bible. I read this to you, and we're done. Uh, somebody wrote this years ago, a fellow preacher, I believe he's in California, his name's R.B. Ulett. And preacher Ulett wrote this, and I've had this, gosh, I can't tell you, I, I used to, um, when I was probably 20, 21 years old, I used to preach a message that I would read this in. And, uh, and man, this thing's a blessing. It, he used, he did a play off of that, that I heard the bells on Christmas Day, if you recognize the little rhyme he uses. But this is what he says, I heard the old preacher speak without one reference to the Greek. This precious book within my hand is God's own word on which I stand. And then the scholars came along and said the old preacher had it wrong. Problems here, conflictions there, and scribal errors everywhere. It's a book essentially correct, but not in every last respect. A fairly certain word, they say, to light our path and guide our way. Then in despair I bowed my head. We have no word of God, I said. If some of this old book is wrong, pray tell. What else does not belong? Will still more manuscripts be found to make us go another round? Correcting, changing, taking out, creating questions, fear and doubt. Must more discoveries come to light before we finally get it right? Will precious doctrines fade away because of what the scholars say? How many errors must we purge because of what the scholars urge? How many versions must we make? How many changes can we take? How will we ever know that we're through, that we possess a scripture true? If a man must find God's word, my friend, when will the changes ever end? (laughs) Here we go. Then to the book again I fled to find out what my father said. Forever settled, never fade, this promise God the Spirit made. A thousand generations hence, that seems a pretty strong defense. A perfect book, then it must be. Man can improve what God gave me. We have a book completely true, instructing us in all we do. Preserved by God, not found by men, inscribed by God the Spirit's pen. If between God or scholars you must choose, be sure the experts always lose. Don't give them a second look. Just keep believing this old book. I'm telling you it's important tonight, friend. And as we've started out this new year, it's January the 7th. And on January the 7th, you say, I ain't got started yet. Get started in the morning. Read a chapter or two tonight if you ain't been. But brother, I can't believe that you're going to hear a message like this and then go away from here saying, well, it's not that important. It's not that important. What else could I tell you that can make you believe that that book is vital? Vital. If you're going to be anything for God, it starts and ends with that book right there. Benefits of the Bible. The importance of reading your Bible. Esther, play something for us if you would. I'm going to give us a chance to respond Uh, at the altar in prayer. Let's all stand tonight. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father, Lord, you put this thing down in my heart, God, to kind of kick our new year off, to get us focused again on what we ought to be doing as the body of Christ, as individual believers, as the saints of God. Help us tonight, right now, make a move to this altar, and Lord, make a commitment to the Lord Jesus tonight that I'm going to read this Bible through cover to cover. And it's not just going to be a one-year commitment. It's going to be a lifelong commitment. 
Uh, daily searching the scriptures daily seeking out of the book of the Lord and reading daily seeing something from the word of God that will help change my life God help these young people to grab a hold of how important this is these adults to see the importance in their life God tonight if for nothing else even if we've been reading it help us Lord to get around an altar and just say thank you for the book where would we be tonight without the precious Bible Thank you so much for this book. Lord, I love it. I love the God that wrote it and gave it to us. God, I pray tonight that you'd help us to heed it, read it, love it, live it. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need to come tonight, you come. How often I have turned to the precious word of Christ needing strength for my weary soul how often has the voice of God addressed the sin in me as he draws me close and makes me whole in the darkest hours of life I faced I've been healed by the word My spirit springs to life anew When I hear from the Lord The voice of God that speaks from the pages The truth of God that stands throughout the ages It's a lamp, it's a light It's the very A source of comfort, cheer, and my heart's delight. I'm so thankful that I have a Bible. Yes, me too. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the book. Decisions I have made have been guided by this book. Speaking truth. When I don't know what to do It stands unchanging in a world Where nothing stays the same It's a constant life for whatever we go through It was true back then, it's still true today You can build your life upon it The foundation upon which I stand I'm thankful I can say That it's the voice of God that speaks from the pages The truth of God that stands throughout the ages It's a lamp, it's a light It's the very bread of life A source of comfort, cheer glad you got a Bible tonight. Glory to God. Thank God for that book. Some people may listen to our broadcast or, or hear this stuff and they say, you're just too fanatical about that book. I don't believe you can be fanatical enough, brother. I'm, I'm, I'm gone on it. I'm gone on it. I believe the book. I, sure, I, wish I, I wish I could live it more than I do. It deserve, it, that book is so wonderful, it deserves followers better than me. I look, I look at how wonderful that book is and how sorry of a Christian I am, and I think, God, you deserve better followers of that book than Cody Zorn. But I'm going to give him a best shot. That's, a, that's, a, that's an amazing book. I'll tell you something about that thing. I was talking to Brother Michael Holsauser last night, and y'all, you don't always hear stuff like this, but I've heard it for years, and then Brother Michael just reaffirmed it the other day. Brother, there are Christian colleges and universities that have, are, are absolutely making men into atheists and tearing down their confidence in that book. There's a fellow come into the auto zone just the other day and talked to Brother Michael Holshauser and said he was a young preacher at one time, excited about God and the Bible, went off to Bible school, and some jackleg in a college got up, and a professor that claims to be a Christian started saying, well, 
the King James is wrong here because the Greek says this, and there's a poor translation here because the Hebrew says that, and it's not a real good rendering here, and that's what they do. And he stole his faith in that Bible, and now that fella is out of church, out of the ministry, and doesn't even believe the Bible's real. Because somebody that thought they were smarter than the book and could correct the book stole that boy's confidence in the Bible. I'm telling you, people going to stand before God for that junk. People going to stand before God for that garbage. I believe the book. Praise the Lord. We are Bible missionary Baptist church. Amen. Yeah. I like, I like how, yeah, Big B. I like out there on the sign, the biggest thing you see is Bible. We're all about the Bible at Bible Missionary Baptist Church. Amen. Yes, we are. All right. Been good to have you tonight. It's an honor to have Brother Justin Bushy and his family. They're missionaries with the Rock of Ages Prison Ministry. We're going to get them to come back sometime and preach for us. But they just stopped in tonight to go to church with us, and it's an honor to have them. Brother, would you mind dismissing us in prayer this evening? Thank you for coming. After he's done, uh, you'll be at liberty.